Now, I'm happy to say that after 1976, the, the, the British government began to seriously think about the situation instead of simply reacting to events. And over the years after 1968, a more coherent strategy emerged. And that strategy can be considered under three headings. Questions relating to security, and that involved what we call normalization, ulsterization, and the development of intelligence. Secondly, social amelioration, you know, tackling the social and economic conditions and addressing the conveniences, the grievances uh, that minorities had. And then thirdly, uh, seeking a political solution agreeable to the parties in Northern Ireland. And what I want to do is, rather than going through the matter in detail, is to take those three headings and, and look briefly at them thematically and then try to come to, to some sort of conclusions or, uh, or reflections, maybe, towards the end. The first one I mentioned was the security matters. And indeed, as the comments were made at the uh, earlier session, uh, that the security forces are very important in terms uh, of giving space and opportunity for people to develop other solutions. Uh, and I'll take it that far, and I don't want to take that argument further than that. A normalization involved initially ending uh, the, and what was called internment, the provisions whereby people were uh, held uh, without trial, uh, which had been the stock response to trouble uh, in Ireland by the British state ever since the you know, late 18th century right through to, to the 20th century. Uh, and whatever arguments there may be about internment working in some situations, in the situation we had in the 1970s, it clearly wasn't working. And so that was wound up. And recourse was then had to, as it were, the uh, criminal law and the criminal courts, although they were tweaked. There, they, there were changes made in terms of creating new offences, uh, and there was a very important change made with regard to the operation of the courts, in that uh, juries were dispensed with and the uh, courts were presided over by a single judge, the so-called Diplock courts. Uh, some people outside of Northern Ireland got a bit excited about the Diplock courts. Not many people within Northern Ireland did because I think they recognised fairly soon that the Diplock courts delivered a better quality of justice than juries had done. And the Diplock courts continue in Northern Ireland in appropriate circumstances and it doesn't give rise to any controversy at all. Miscarriages of justice did occur in, with regard to our troubles. Most of the miscarriages of justice occurred as a result of jury trials. And there's only one clear established case of a miscarriage of justice in the Diplock courts. I don't exclude the possibility there may have been others. Ulsterization, as the term was used, was also a question of police primacy. Up until the late 70s, uh, the army had effectively displaced the police and the, from then on, the policy was to try and get the police back as the, the primary uh, agents with regard to uh, administration and, and, and so on, backed up by uh, local uh, volunteer forces, uh, army forces, the Ulster Defence Regiment, later the Royal Irish Regiment. Uh, this was because local people with local knowledge are going to be more effective than persons who don't know the community and speak with a different language, that you'll get, or sorry, a different accent. Uh, you, you'll, you'll get a different response with, with rap matter, and that does actually help. One consequence, unfortunately, of Ulsterization is that it then offered the IRA a whole lot of soft targets in the shape of off-duty policemen and UDR who could be attacked at home and were attacked at home, and there were very significant casualties suffered as a result. But that, mind you, backfired on the IRA in that attacking people in their homes uh, sort of, as it were, revealed or emphasized the essentially sectarian character of the IRA's campaign. Uh, so while it, it caused, as I say, a lot of casualties and quite a lot uh, of you know, uh, hurt to the community, uh, the normalization, the ulsterization, using local police uh, and locally recruited soldiers was actually a good uh, element in it. The third element I mentioned was the question of intelligence. Now, this is crucially important because if you're dealing with any sort of terrorist situation, Gaining intelligence is hugely important. Uh, and in order to gain intelligence, uh, of course, there are various you know, electronic surveillance. And it's not to be underestimated, I can tell you. Having had my telephone tapped on a number of occasions, the only thing I have in doubt is as to which organizations were tapping my telephone. But that's, that's another one. One mustn't assume if it's tapped that it's only done by the evil government. There are other people involved in, in, in doing that. But anyway, that's, that's by the way. As I say, in, uh, electronic surveillance can do an awful lot. But the most effective is actually human intelligence. And if you're going to recruit human intelligence, it's best, it is easier to do it 
if you've managed to convince the, 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 the target population that the cause of the government is essentially just and the cause of the terrorist is not just. Uh, and in order to do that, you, you have to have it where in, that there has to be what I would call an ideological war, uh, that the government needs to identify the ideology that's driving uh, terrorists and to publicly combat that uh, and to convince the population, as I say, that the terrorists are wrong and the government is right. And when you reach that situation, then it becomes much easier to recruit uh, terrorists. Uh, and I'll come back to, to that later. But by the li late 1980s, the government were claiming uh, that they were managing to foil four out of every five operations that paramilitary groups uh, attempted to, uh, to, 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 to launch. And there's no doubt uh, that that was the case. Now, by then, but it took time to reach there. The second theme re deals with the amelioration and removal of grievances. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, the economic situation in Northern Ireland was pretty grim, uh, partly due to world conditions, but also due to the circumstances within Northern Ireland. Uh, unemployment peaked at over 20%, and the place in, in the 1970s looked pretty grim. Uh, it was not a happy place to be, and a lot of people, uh, have, as it were, voted with their feet in that respect. But if you come forward 15 years into the early 90s, it was a different situation entirely. Uh, during the early 90s, most years, Northern Ireland economy grew a double the United Kingdom average. Unemployment and GDP per capita, which up until then had always been higher, unemployment higher, GDP lower in Northern Ireland than in any other part of the United Kingdom. But by the mid-90s, we actually had a situation where we overtook some regions uh, in Wales and, and, and England. And that remains to be the case. We did, and it's quite a remarkable change. Jobs were being created, mainly through, small, through local small businesses. There wasn't any major uh, outside uh, investment at this time, actually. There had been at other times, but most of the increase in jobs at that, that time were being generated locally with small, uh, local small businesses. Jobs were growing at a considerable rate then, higher at that stage than in the, the Republic of Ireland. The, the explosive growth that the Republic of Ireland uh, experienced actually came in the mid to late 1990s and uh, it's turning a little bit sour now and we hope that our situation doesn't get uh, as difficult as well. But nonetheless, the, the point being made here is that by when you get to the early mid 1990s, the economic situation is quite different. The, the, the place looks different. There's so much more investment in, in the area uh, that it gave quite a different atmosphere and feel to situations. There are two other factors of a general nature that one needs to bear in mind. If we're comparing 1970 and 1990, one of the things that happened then is that, the, is it where the, the, the context changed, changed. This is partly due to the European Union, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, sorry, the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland both joined the European Union in the early 1970s. Uh, and in the, the atmosphere generated by the development of the European Union meant that by the 1990s, the, the existence of old fashioned territorial nationalism and territorial claims being made by one EU member and another EU member were, were just inappropriate. Uh, in particular, the Republic of Ireland benefited from membership of the European Union and effectively re reinvented itself in those 20 years as a modern Western European country, moving miles away from the old uh, traditional Irish Republican uh, ideology, so famously summed up uh, by de Valera uh, in, in the 1930s. By the 1990s, it was a different place uh, and it was in a different position with regard to militant republicanism than it had been earlier. And another factor which uh, we were not very you know, happy with, but the uh, Anglo-Irish agreement that was entered into between the British government and the Irish government in 1985 and imposed upon unionists uh, without consultation or seeking consent had the effect actually of giving to northern nationalists confidence uh, that governments would no longer ignore their interests, even though the Anglo-Irish agreement didn't deliver for nationalists all the things they thought it would do in 1985, partly because of the extent of the unionist reaction to it, uh, leading to the British government having uh, second thoughts and realising the desirability of having agreement from both sections of the community. Nonetheless, it did give a greater sense uh, of confidence to northern nationalists and helped to, uh, to, to get at that basic sense uh, of alienation that there had been uh, at the start of the, the Troubles. Uh, 